Okay, everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome to Crypto Wednesdays, episode 30, uh, taking place on May 3rd, 2023. You're hereby advised. Today, we have a very great show. Um, the topic is building 21st century communities with NFTs. And as always, I'd like to thank my wonderful co hosts uh, Anastasia. Say hi to everyone. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, having me. It's great to have you on. We're, we're, we're going to talk over each other and cause drama and ask lots of questions. It'll be a fantastic show. So it'll, it'll be great. Okay. Um, I, I want to, of course, introduce our panelists. I'm going to start off with Andras, who, who was instrumental in putting this together. We're, we're going to do quick 30-second introductions of uh, each person just so we get name, rank, and serial number, and then we'll dive deeper into your personal stories and kind of weave this all together. So Andras, I'm, I'm starting with you. Um, just give us the 30 second version of you. Got it. My name is Andras Krzysztof. I'm an entrepreneur. I've been working with technology for much longer. I want to remember, I started blockchain about 10 years ago. We built a lot of stuff. And right now we are working on bringing tech, bringing communities to the 21st century with sustainable communities. Wow, you really did it. Okay, uh, Zolt, please. Hi everyone, my name is Joa. I'm a digital artist coming from the game development. I spent like 15 years there. I'm working in Web3 since 2021 and creating all kinds of artwork since then and experimenting with the technology and how can uh, find new ways to create art and uh, show to the community. Fantastic. Tony. Hey guys, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm uh, largely involved in uh, a lot of DAOs within the uh, blockchain ecosystem and a, a number of startups, most recently the Degen Arcade, which is a blockchain uh, kind of uh, video arcade um, that uh, ties uh, old game machines into the blockchain. Old game machines into the blockchain? Do you have Frogger? Yes, we actually, we, we actually took a claw machine that you uh, can uh, fish out a, instead of a plushie, you fish out a, a ball. And when the ball has a, a prize, that it's an NFT. So you actually, um, the, the ball actually gives you a random NFT like, out, of, out of a claw machine. Interesting. Okay. And just so, I love the international nature of this. Let's go around. And if you're comfortable, where are you? Andras, where are you physically? I know that's an outdated concept. Yeah. Right now I'm in Dubai. Right now. And normally? Right. On planet Earth. On planet Earth. Okay, good answer. <laughs> I, I once heard that everyone wants to, you know, go to heaven, but you got to remember that we're on Earth and Earth is in the stars, therefore we're already in heaven. So that there you go. Okay, so <laughs> if you don't mind, where are you? I'm coming, uh, calling from the sunny UK, uh, southern England, from the mm -hmm. seaside. Actually, it's a beautiful day here today, so it's rare, but it's nice. Wow, beautiful <laughs> day in England. Yeah. Nice. Slightly oxymoronic, but I like it. Tony, I'm jealous of you. Um, I am currently in Tokyo. I am here for uh, a couple of block blockchain NFT events, and mm -hmm. I'm in Tokyo right now, but I'm usually based out of LA, out of Los Angeles. Oh, okay. We're, we're, we're ex-neighbors, because that's where I'm from. Yes. Yes, yes. yes, yes, yes uh, I'm currently in Cyprus, and to say that my base is Earth would probably be the best description of where I normally live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I say that my base is my laptop until I can finally get a chip implanted. Exactly Over that, there. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm working that also. Okay, now let's get into the meat. The, the, the goal where we're going to end up, we're going to kind of climb the mountain up to here, is how to enable and how to build 21st century communities using NFTs. But I bet... To, we're going to sort of stack concepts on top of each other one by one. So now I want to go a little bit deeper and hear about your professional background and your blockchain journey and how it led you down ultimately the NFT path. And then we're going to sort of weave in your narratives to sort of build up. So I'll keep on going with this order. Andras, the, the extended version, please, of your blockchain journey to NFTs. Uh, I started working with blockchains when uh, Bitcoin was $30 and Ethereum did not exist yet. 
We actually built and deployed the first Bitcoin ATMs in our Asia back in 2014. Then we wrote our own layer one because we wanted to build a system where anybody can issue their own tokens. Think about like a proto ERC20 system, but again, there was no Ethereum yet. When Ethereum came around though, in 2015, summer, the beta came out, uh, it became clear to us that uh, Vitalik is start, uh, smarter than me. So we dropped our technology and we started to work with Ethereum. We have been working with Ethereum and smart contracts since the beta days, uh, technically. And uh, we have been working with this technology for the same reasons for the last 10 years, because it can enable the the, the transfer of value between two people uh, uh, without a trusted third party. This is basically the only important part of blockchains and the rest is just like fluff and uh, and the syntax uh, uh, around it. Now, so, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do what I always do and take advantage of my host right to interrupt and ask questions when I hear good stuff. So the the transferring value at a distance without an intermediate without an intermediary of course is inherent to Bitcoin right from the start. Um, maybe yeah. first inherent to Bitcoin, but yeah. you had that with Bitcoin and that by itself wouldn't be a need to go to Ethereum. What was the extra special sauce with Ethereum? The ability to uh, uh, to modify it and deploy the uh, deploy software for the use case that you are working on. Uh, transferring value in terms of the Bitcoin works uh, as long as you want to transfer Bitcoin, uh, sure. but it, that cannot actually do much uh, much of anything else. And even when it comes to uh, other uh, like uh, uh, fungible, fungible uh, uh, tokens like Bitcoin, Ethereum, or whatnot, that is just the fungible part. In order to to transfer a much more complex uh, set of uh, values, you need non fungible systems, and for that, that is technically what NFTs are. So if you think about it, uh, transferring value in terms of like monetary value, I know it's not money. But if the analogy is there, then it's like Bitcoin or Ethereum. But if you want to transfer while you like the, the right to own a piece of music or right to own a piece of art or, or the right for certain privileges, mm -hmm. for that, you need something more than a fungible system. And for that, Ethereum and its smart contract system can provide that uh, uh, fundamental system that upon which you can build on. Okay, great, great answer. And when you say Ethereum, do you mean Ethereum and its EVM compatible cousins, or do you mean any smart or any smart contract capable mature blockchain? How, how are you defining this this, this ecosystem yes. as it relates to Te you? Technically, technically, uh, technically, any smart contract capable um, uh, chain can do this. Um, so there is no difference in uh, between them. And uh, if I would go deeper, that would probably start another religious war. So I want to, uh, so I want to uh, avoid that. But technically, any smart contract capable system can do the same thing. Yeah. Well, you know, I like religious wars. So, what's the best platform for, in for issuing NFTs now? Uh, for. Okay, that's a loaded question, and I would need to know <laughs> what, you, what you what you need what you exactly mean uh, mean by NFTs. But why don't I just answer what we are uh, using right now? We are sure. using Ethereum and its layer twos, for example, Polygon, because in this way we can have the the latest innovation and we can have affordable gas prices as well, which is I think which is a nice combination. Fair enough. Okay, that, that that was an artful dodge, but that dodge was good enough that I'm gonna let it slide. Uh, Zolt, please. Actually, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. Sorry, sorry, Andres, you got you got me involved in your answer, so I I skipped the the last word. Galaxis, what is this about? Galaxis is a uh, is a framework that enables anyone or any entity to engage their community and provide them tangible, ownable value over the blockchain that they can own and engage with, and also enables that community to support the project or entity or person who is providing this value. So basically, is it's a, it creates a fully ownable, transferable value, and value not necessarily the monetary value, value is what the actual community values 
So it could be like a community of an actor, an artist, mm. or an athlete, or extremes like politicians or, or whatever. Mm. And these communities exist, and these communities appreciate and value things. With the system that we are building, the person or entity who is creating this community or being the, in the center of this community can actually provide this value to the community members in a way that the members can actually own it, own it in a physical way, meaning that you own it like you own a phone or, or, or something. And then that value is theirs to own, to, uh, to sell, to transfer, to lose, to destroy, it's theirs. And in, in similar way, it is possible to create a community where the center of the community can provide value this kind of value to the community members and can enable the community members to support this center of the community, essentially creating sustainable communities. So this is the framework that Galaxies is building, which is meant for any kind of community uh, in existence. And, and did so you, just I mean, a quick you, question. Um, like we, we all know about how NFTs is used in like some, you know, gaming communities or whatever, but NFT is like a key. So you have this like gated community. So in your case, NFT can not only be used as a key or like access um, key, whatever, but also as a store of values that this community provides for you to like content, for example, or something like that and can be exchanged with other members. It, it, think about it as an ownable, transferable membership card that can have a lot of extra features and functions that make sense for that particular community. And, and then okay. if, you, if, you, if you had your journey from Bitcoin to Ethereum to Galaxis, what, what was your epiphany moment where you realized that this is a core need that needs to get handled? Since day one, this is the same need. This is the same need basically providing a digital system for people that can provide stuff that can be owned by an individual. That is what actually blockchain can do, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's Ethereum, whether it's something else. This is its, I, at least for me, this is its core value proposition. It can create digital objects that work like physical objects. The same way as I can own this phone and you cannot take it from me over the internet, you can only take it from me if you come to me and hit my head in a, with a stick, then you can take, my, take the phone. Blockchain technology can provide digital objects that have this kind of physical type of functionality, physical feature that they can be owned the same way as a physical object can be owned. And in my opinion, this is basically the only important part of blockchain. Again, the rest is just hype and, uh, and, uh, and uh, details. But this is the feature that makes it different from any other piece of technology that we've got. Fair enough. And, and by the way, I want to welcome you to Dubai. I know it's your first day of your trip here. And I know you're hosting a wonderful dinner this evening at the Capital Club, bringing this Galaxis method, you know, message to the wider Dubai community. I think you're going to find it's very vibrant here and very receptive. So yep. as the unofficial unacknowledged mayor of Dubai, I, I welcome you. So, uh, okay, Zolt, go for it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so uh, my journey uh, into web trades, it's probably for many of us started with one, one people, one person who told us, what is this about? What is Web3? What are NFTs? And actually, this person is here in the room. <laughs> it was Andres, oh, actually, in a really nice Zoom call. And uh, it started a avalanche <laughs> for me because I felt this is something new here and I want to be involved 100%. And since I felt this is something new coming, this is how the, the new, the new era of creation bo was born, which is a collection of my projects in, in the Web3. So first, uh, with Andres and Galaxy, I had the chance to be part of their uh, founder collection and, and provide the uh, artwork for the membership cards, for the founder cards. But I felt I, I have to create something for my own as well to, to be present in the space and, and represent what I am doing. So 
this is how the first uh, Genesis collection was born. It was called Etherheads. Um, I created something that uh, reflected my, how to say it, I think, uh, what affected me at the moment in the space. And mm -hmm. I like to uh, keep this way uh, always. So just give something back, but coming from outside and uh, what I feel about the space and show it to the people and give it to the people through art. And what Andras mentioned, the, the ownership part of NFTs. Uh, I, I look myself mainly as an artist, also I'm a founder of Neo, but I'm, I see myself in the space as, as an artist and also as a community member of many other communities. And what the sense of ownership through NFTs bring to artists is, is a connection with the collector. And mm -hmm. it's, it's such an extra feeling that you wasn't able to feel uh, or utilize before. before can, can I interrupt one second? You're saying a thought that I've never actually had before which is that I've always heard it from the collector perspective that it gives them connection to the artist. But what you're saying is something new for me, at least, which is it's a bi-directional, it's a circuit of relationship, which is you're feeling yeah. a new uh, connection with the owner or collector because that individual has an a NFT of your art. Yes, because uh, for, uh, for many artists, as I see, uh, creating something is everything for them and for me as well. Mm. And to know uh, and, and follow up who actually owns what you worked on and spent a lot of time to create, it means a lot for artists. And uh, since the blockchain technology, uh, you can follow the ownership of your work. And this is also an extra, extra feature, which is never there before. So no, it's, now, a, it's, it's a new feature with NFTs generally. It's a new feature with the newer companies like Galaxis. Like, is it something, is it part of your C721, the standard or how so? I mean, it's just the sim simple terms that uh, you can check who owns your NFT. That's that's what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. So, Can you yeah, message but, them? Uh, you know? I does think anyone know? <laughs> I think lately you can more often as, as the people are, are more and more doxed in, in the mm -hmm. space and the wallet address ma matching with the, with the Twitter names, it's much easier to follow up who is the owner because they are uh, often um, uh, showcase what their uh, latest um, piece in their collection and mm. share uh, the name of the artist. So yeah, I think you can follow up. So I guess oh, yeah. like Sorry, just, just, just real fast. So Dave in the audience, thank you, Dave. Dave says Etherscan block chat can be used to message wallets directly. Actually, I think I've seen that before, but thanks for reminding me. I, I'd forgotten that's a great point. So yes, that's a, that's fantastic. You can message people directly. Thanks, Dave. That's good. interesting. So we, how, long, how long have you been an artist? <laughs> Yeah, the, the common answer since I was a kid. Yeah, I came from the traditional artist education side uh, in the high school and university. Then I started to work straight after and um, was a graphic designer, concept artist, illustrator for 15 years. So I, I could say I, I, I always did, um, was working as an artist and, and creating artworks as a job and as a hobby as well. And Anastasia, you were saying? Yeah, I just wanted to, to to comment on so what you're saying is all this is very interesting. So I guess you're like this you facilitate this connection with the owners of your collections. And especially if you're developing a certain collection in collaboration with this community where it will be used. But then also, like, is it true that like if you know who owns your art, then it can sort of impact your future collections? Uh absolutely. Absolutely, I, I could say that, especially with uh, collaborations and partnerships. Uh, when you are introducing a new community that can easily expand your awareness and uh, your name to new people. And, and yeah, that, that affects your uh, art as well, because maybe uh, that brings a new partnership and you have to create something completely new you uh, didn't expect it before and so forth.
yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's cool so basically the owners of your art current owners kind of become a little bit of a creator themselves mm. yes yes uh and uh especially what you're working on uh, one of the latest project called art lab uh the collectors literally affecting what i'm working on because they decide what i should draw next so we are doing votes votings and uh, chat on the discord so they can decide what i should draw interesting you can do uh, like a, a live effect. stream platform <laughs> with with like live stream platform where different artists create art and in real time the viewers can like vote on different features and like stake something to affect it. This would be like a cool project. <laughs> it is actually. I mean, uh, this project called Art Lab and it contains different characters. Uh -huh. And it started in a time when uh, everyone just throwing out new, new PFPs every day, hundreds of new PFPs, every kind of PFPs uh, just floating the space. And I thought, okay, stop for a minute. Why didn't we ask the community what they want, actually? So the art have started with this uh, concept. Guys, I got lots of people chatting me, asking me what the link is. So I'm, I'm going to multitask for a second. But though it's funny, the way, the way you're describing it, you almost have a DAO deciding what new art you're going to create. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, have you thought about well, that at all? Or what, 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 you're saying, I, yeah, I, but I like, the, uh, where's, where's the line? <laughs> I, I really like simple solutions, and uh, a DAO is a great solution, but mm -hmm. to keep uh, things simple, I, I just go for simple voting and keep that on the Discord and just listen to the people's opinion. I mean, we have a small community, so it's easier to manage all these things. You you don't have to handle tens of thousands of people. I, 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 I agree. I mean, people throw the way around the word. They take the word or acronym down, just throw it. They kind of DAO wash everything these days. Uh, Tony, <laughs> I feel like this leads into you because you're, you can probably set us straight on DAOs because you seem to be the DAO guy based on what, what I've read about you. And just kind of give, give us your give us your blockchain path, how you got kind of NFTs and DAOs and and why you're in Japan, so I can get extremely jealous. <laughs> I uh, I came into DAOs, interestingly. Well, I came into crypto actually through through Bitcoin, like everybody else. Um, I came into Bitcoin uh, kind of looking for a solution for some of the clients that I dealt with in, in Southern California. I, I worked in Southern California for most of my life in in the immigrant in the what we call the immigrant space, basically working with a lot of the undocumented immigrant community in in, that, in, in, in Southern California. And I was looking for a solution that would provide people a, a, a method of sending home money because uh, one, of, one of the main things that immigrants do is they send money back home. Mm -hmm. And I stumbled upon um, a, a particular instance where a client needed to send a large sum of money and he was kind of like, what, what, what would be the solutions to send it? And obviously, when you use remittance companies, there's a, a big fee that you pay for sending money. And so then sort of like that led to sort of like, well, could Bitcoin be the solution to solve you know, to send the money. One of the early promises of, of Bitcoin was actually that, was that you could send borders money, permissionless money. Um, and so I stumbled into Bitcoin on that. And then and, and, uh, through Bitcoin, obviously discovered Ethereum, was instantly enamored with Ethereum based on the whole, uh, of some mm -hmm. of the things that, uh, that um, Andrash spoke about with regards to the, uh, you know, with the smart contract aspect of it, you know, the, the lack of any, the, the not, the not needing an intermediary for a business transaction. So it's kind of enamored with, uh, with, with, um, with Ethereum and sort of stumbled upon Ethereum when the ICO craze came about in 2017. So participated in a ton of ICOs, most of them which all went to zero, <laughs> but uh, I still participated in them. And I was really enamored with the whole technology. And so I stuck in with Ethereum uh, throughout the ICO process and the, and the bear market that preceded 2018. 2019, mm. and really just sort of fell enamored with uh, with that whole community of you know thinkers and what crypto sort of represented, uh, and then sort of preceded with uh, you know led, led the way to 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 NFTs because during the ICO craze we also had the initial starts of the NFTs which was like mostly around CryptoPunks where we, where you basically had initially art on the blockchain with with CryptoPunks or generative art on the blockchain. Right. And then that's sort of like, I think actually when you mentioned DAOs, the first ICO that I did 
was actually around DAOs with a project called Aragon, uh, which was actually a governance uh, DAO token, um, which is actually one of the first ICOs that I did. Um, and Aragon's still around, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I was enamored with DAOs as well because I work a lot with the immigrant population, once again, that is sort of self-organizing, usually around the communities that they come from, it's different regions in Mexico. So for me, DAOs were like this really kind of like awesome experience of like, oh, you have this decentralized autonomous organization that can sort of govern itself and sort of be, be able to participate in a way that DAOs, DAOs for me are really interesting because like you have the normally you have organizations like you think of like uh, any 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 co cooperative or any sort of nonprofit or even any corporation. It's essentially you can sort of say it's akin to a DAO. It's it's really a an organization. In this case, a DAO is just you have the layer of blockchain, which is like okay, you could have a governance token that allows you to vote. You can sort of like normally have you normally have in any democracy or any source of government, you normally have people voting. And with a DAO, you sort of can say, all right, well, that those votes are now on chain. You know, that how Gordon votes, how you know Andras votes, how Anastasia votes, and Tony votes, you can sort of have that on chain. So there's like some really interesting concepts about that take organizations to the next level when you discuss them as DAOs and being not only organizations, but also autonomous. And also decentralized. I, I always joke, and you know, I, I lecture on securities law, and I always joke that a, a DAO without decentralization is just an owl. Yeah. Think yeah. about it. So, so, <laughs> so, so, you 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 touch on a really interesting topic about securities, right? And I happen to live in the United States, and there's always the Howey test, which is like, if there's a token that. <laughs> derives a dividend or that essentially pays you some sort of some sort of asset, then you're venturing into the security territory, right? But DAOs were never really, to me, DAOs were never really meant to be securities because most DAOs really are DAOs around a specific issue, individuals coming together to address different issues. And so DAOs were always organizations. And to me, it was kind of silly that we would consider them securities only because they never really, most DAOs were never intended to have a financial profit motive and mostly organizational uh, human coordination motives rather than, than money-making motives. I'm, I'm going to respectfully disagree with you. I, I think probably because who you are, your experience and your goals, you're, you're subconsciously filtering the projects and people that would use DAOs in that way. But is it, the very first DAO on Ethereum was basically an, an investment company, you know, where you're voting what to invest in and to, there's been lots since then, and yeah, you're talking about the DAO. Yes, yeah, I agree. I think the DAO, which is yes, but go ahead. Uh, I, uh, I think I think DAOs are good population, or or, or I mean, they're, they're great for organization. That's the whole point of the name. But there's lots of people I see skating. Let me take a step back. The, the original, lots of people worked on this idea in the in the beginning, and I don't think anyone can take credit for it. But Vitalik has a good article way back when where he's talking about a, a DAO is an online entity that has its own economy. Like you, you need a token to have a DAO. I, I remember reading that like four or five years ago and going, huh. And then he kind of posited this idea that the DAO can become an employer of sorts. And really we're going to be human serving the DAOs. And, and when you add artificial intelligence to that, things get really interesting. The And I, I think you're on point with the how we, and we're going a little bit far afield, but it's okay. We're going on point with the how we yeah. test which is one of the prongs is profit through the efforts of others or solely through the efforts of others. So if you're a, if you have a DAO token, whether it's governance or stake, and that token is appreciating in value uh, because other people in the DAO are doing things, there's, there's, you're, you're venturing into that territory where, where I personally feel DAOs have more protection from a securities law point of view is the decentralized component. Because if you have a truly decentralized DAO, you no longer really have an issuer anymore. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. who, who who is the issuer of the token? The community? Okay, go, sue a thousand of them, have fun. But just, but for, for you, you're, you're I, I kind of want to pursue this. I haven't really seen enough DAOs. It, it sounds like you're doing on the ground political or social organization through DAOs. 
I mean, you, you, yeah, you mentioned I, before the show that people have to show up and in real life to join your DAO. First time I've heard of that, but that's great. <laughs> so, so yeah, so, so, so I'm in, for instance, I'm in Tokyo for an event called Bright Moments and it's a, it's a DAO around NFT galleries. You know, oh. the, the Bright Moments DAO is, is, is governed by essentially a core group of individuals that we call crypto collections that are basically our, our, our individuals who, who govern the 10 different cities that are gonna be, that are gonna have a gallery, right? So, so, mm -hmm. so in this case, the Bright Moments DAO, once again, NFT gallery has 10 cities. And so it started off in Venice, California, then it did New York, mm -hmm. uh, Berlin, London, and now Mexico City, or then Mexico City, and now Tokyo, and in October it'll do Buenos Aires. And each one of those cities is governed essentially by a thousand crypto citizens, right? So, so it kind of takes homage, pays homage to the uh, ten thousand crypto punks that, that sort of led the way of, of NFTs, because you know we mm -hmm. can pretty much credit crypto punks as leading, paving the way for, for NFTs. But in this case, it's a DAO, right? It's an organization that sets about to. Um, promote art and in this case, <laughs> NFT art, generative art predominantly. Um, and yeah, it's governed as a DAO. It's a, it's so there's a, each one of us who owns a crypto collection can vote within the core member of the DAO, which is like, think of it like a, like a corporate board or like, mm -hmm. a, you know, that's headquarters. And then each city has a thousand members that are also, um, that also govern that particular city. And so that's, to me, was like a really interesting um, concept because for that DAO, there's a lot of DAOs where you can participate um, online, if you will. You know, you can you can mm -hmm. you can you can have a uh, you can you you can have a token and you can connect with 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 your crypto wallet or you know, and you can participate in that aspect. But with, for instance, with Bright Moments, you have to actually be physically present. Like you can't mint a crypto citizen unless you're actually in at the actual location. So like the individuals who are in Tokyo who made the trip all the way to Tokyo from wherever part of the world, they can only mint their crypto Tokyoite by actually physically being present at the, at the site. And so therefore that's um, a DAO in this specific area. That, I mean, um, is, is the person that meets that, that individual and verifies who they are, are they like a biological validator on the network somehow? Uh, or? <laughs> yeah, they, they sign a transaction that uh, mm -hmm. that they sign a transaction that basically denotes that they are minting a, uh, a, a, a crypto citizen. So the transaction is done physically at the location. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I, guess the, I guess that's a way to think about it. It's like, you know, biologically they have to be present in order to mint. Although there is uh, an aspect of surrogate dele or delegation, if you will, like, like if you could be a, a crypto citizen and you can say, I'm delegating my minting to Tony, and then now I can mint on your behalf, right? But that's most people are actually minting personally in in, in, that's in real life. dangerous. Interesting. Okay, I, I I'm a fan of Dow well, government so, 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 let, so let, let me let me push back. Why is it dangerous? Um, I th I think I think part of the premise of a Dow is democratizing involvement and equalizing involvement mm -hmm. and kind of getting away from the Westphalian the representative de democracy model towards a more direct democracy model. When you when you <laughs> go down delegation, especially if you're around re-delegation of voting and choice, you're already taking what's not a complete, in some ways, Dow voting is completely transparent because it's on chain, but on, in some ways it's completely right. untransparent because you don't know who you're talking about or whether that one person owns multiple addresses and getting 20 votes. You know, it, it's, it's subject to manipulation already. And I think you can maybe delegation is valid, but you need to be very thoughtful about how you how you implement it. Yeah, so I think two two things. One is that you're only minting a citizen, and 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 then you once you mint a citizen, you move on to a vote, right? So I can mm -hmm. hold multiple citizens for say Tokyo, but I can only hold, cast one vote. So so even though I can mint your token. If I hold that token, one, I wouldn't be minting the token to my wallet. I would mint it. It would be minting to your wallet. Um, so, so I think that there's two different things here. There's one is the actual token that allows you to be a crypto citizen, hmm. and then the actual casting of the vote, which is also on chain, right? So I think that I don't see the danger in the way potentially you're seeing the danger, because in this case, 
I'm, I wouldn't essentially be voting on your behalf. I would only be minting a crypto citizen on your I, behalf. I, I got it. I, I and got that's it, I got separate it. from the vote. All right, I'm calling time on this one. This is a rabbit hole I would love to go down, but you're kind of segueing into the topic of community. You know, DAO and community naturally go right. together, and we're going into how NFTs enable 21st century communities. First, one of my favorite expressions I use at every show is explain it to me like I'm five years old. What yeah, specifically like can you <laughs> like that? What specifically? Can you do with a non-fungible token, a ERC721, that you can't do with an ERC20? What what exactly is enabled? Oh, wow. So yeah, you know, I'm feel free to jump in if you're feeling technically inclined. I think I think Andrash would do a better job than I would do about that. But just before Andrash, I think what's really interesting about non-fungible tokens is that you can think of non-fungible tokens to take out the tech side of it as a non-fungible token could be anything. It could represent a physical object. It could represent what we just talked about, it, the governance of a DAO. It could actually represent a membership. Uh, it could represent, um, a, like you mentioned, a token share. Like Think of like a, a non-fungible token that earns you passive income. And this is where we get into securities laws, right? But, but uh, mm -hmm. with that, I'll let Andras give a, more of a technical explanation as to why uh, fungible tokens are important. Uh, Andres, you're, you're on mute, I think. Sorry. So it's basically straightforward, and Tony got it right. Uh, Non-fungible tokens can be, for example, membership cards. We have membership cards. You have a membership cards. I have a membership cards. You have a VIP perk on it. My, my don't. It's non-fungible. You cannot represent it with an ERC20 token. And can you not accomplish the same with an ERC20? No, you cannot because the ERC20 is, the, the point is you have a dollar, I have a dollar. Your dollar and my dollar are exchangeable. They are the same and they, if they would not be the same, then that would break the whole system. Here, you have a membership card, I have a membership card, but our membership cards are not equal. And this is the fundamental difference between fungible and non-fungible use cases. So, so if, if, even if I have, Suppose there's one class of membership in an organization, in a community, and maybe this is, we're heading to Galaxis territory here. So it's got a hundred members and there, there's one class of membership only. And I issue, I think a hundred unique NFTs, one for each member of the membership. They're, they're not, even though they're all for the same class of membership, these things are not interchangeable in a way that a ERC-20 is. Each one is a unique sort of generous item. Is this gets, this gets unmanageable, unmanageable very quickly. Mm -hmm. How about one of the hundred person will have a, a special uh, a special right to, to meet with the president once? Or how about three of the other members have completed something for which they got some kind of privilege that works for like uh, three weeks, let's say a discount. So very quickly, you end up with so many different types of membership that 1,000 members will very soon have 1,000 different membership cards, all of them basically reflecting their own personality and, and status and standing and, uh, and everything in that particular club or, or group or, or something. There is no way to keep issuing a fungible uh, token for each of those kind of things. It's much more easier if you have a membership card, all the membership cards are membership cards, but they can actually, uh, they can actually upgrade, they can actually upgrade, they can actually have their own private history, they can actually collect things that, uh, that, that members who are using that membership cards uh, did and do. So they are all different. You okay? You that's, cannot, that's a great answer. Uh, yeah. So the um, so, so at a very small scale, at a trivial scale, maybe some of this you could get away with with the R twenty C twenties. But you hit a combinatorial combinatoric, combinatoric yeah. whatever the word is combinatorial issue. <laughs> yep. You know, the, the moment you try to scale, and it becomes yes. immediately unmanageable. So th this yep. is where ERC seven twenty one and non fungible tokens rise to the rescue. That's, and then there, that's correct. Okay, and, and then is there a programmatic context within which these tokens can operate that 
give them additional powers or restrictions or relationships beyond the simple code of the smart contract that makes the token itself? Not, 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 within, the, not within the standard of the 721. This is basically partially what we have done with galaxies to create a, this extra set of libraries or smart contracts that you can use with any kind of ERC-721 or uh, NFT tokens that gets you all this upgradability, utility, and, uh, and features and functions that make sense for your particular community or group or club. Okay, so the, the, the 721 is a standard. Everyone has to operate with it. The, it's not individually sensible, but you're creating sort of an operational context with, within which the 721s can exist that has the yeah. effect of making them much more powerful. That is correct. And we leave the 721 alone. 721s are still 721s. We are not changing that. It means all these so-called membership cards are compatible with the rest of the ecosystem. They can be bought, sold, put it on OpenSea, put it on any other market, it will mm -hmm. all work. But they have this extra layer, what we call the, uh, the set of contracts, the, the trade registry that holds everything that uh, makes them unique in the, in the context of the other uh, membership cards of the same uh, group. Interesting. Now, I'm gonna throw this to the group. Do, do you, you know, we have our historical way of doing things uh, human beings forming organizations, forming communities. It used to be in person, you know, then with telegraph and telephone and everything else, we started getting distance relationships. What's, what's in, now, of course, when the social media scary AI age, what, what is a 21st century community anyway? I know that's a big, scary question, but what is it? But same thing, a group of like-minded people or a group of people working towards the same goal or, or having the same ideas. What, what technology did to us is not that broke it down. It extended it because now I can actually connect with the people who, who let's say, think about security on the same, same way as I do or, or they like the same kind of anime uh, that, that I do. And I don't have to look for them around my living area or around my, my, my hometown, but I can find them in, in, in New York, in, in, in Paris and everywhere else. So this is the good part. What mm -hmm. we missed here is the ability to actually uh, exchange value uh, with these people. For example, artist, Jolt. He, when the internet happened, then suddenly Jod found that his art suddenly has a three billion, uh, the population of three billion of audience. But the only thing that he could not do, he, not could, not monetize. he yeah. could not monetize it in any shape or form mm -hmm. because the internet was made for sharing. It's purely sharing and any kind of attempt to kind of lock it down, DRM and all that kind of nonsense, is not going to work. What works is that Jotna can give a certain digital item that everybody can see that it came from Jot and now it's owned by me. It's not the JPEG. Nobody cares about the JPEG. It's like, it's like I take a picture of the Mona Lisa and now I'm, I'm selling the Mona Lisa. Nobody would think that. The JPEG itself is not important. What's important is that Jot created something Everybody knows that he created it and now I own it. And there is no way for anybody else to fake it. And that is what it's basically enabled Jod to monetize his creativity online without relying on the, on the big guys, on, on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the content providers, the service providers, the Googles, the Apples, the, the Amazons. It's him and his community. And he doesn't need anybody else to deplatform him to decide whether his art is actually wanted by this platform. Nobody cares. It's him and his community, and he can actually give the community something that the community can own without any third parties. Now, one, one thing I when think I was kinda... super... go ahead. Reminds me of this conversation we had last Wednesday with Vinay and Materium and how they were talking about this, mm -hmm. yeah. like. Uh, 
peer-to-peer -peer trade and commerce. And so I guess the main two things that would be differentiating 21st century communities would be that they're more remote and more peer-to-peer -peer potentially, well, not uh, like. Think about this this way. The internet itself is provided a one-way avenue. And what was missing is the, is the feedback, is the way for people to actually uh, create this global village, so to say. So Jot can set up his own little stand in this global village and sell his art. And everybody can buy his art now without having to having to uh, give 30 percent or whatever percent to big uh, uh, to big providers mm -hmm. and that layer was simply missing so you can think about blockchain and think about nfts in a way that is simply providing this missing layer for the internet interesting now i i i, I find the art use case for nft to be fascinating because when you that CryptoPunks jpeg it's just a bunch of zeros and ones it's it's freely copyable. It's it's not you're you're actually not taking a snapshot of the Mona Lisa. You you have a digitized object that's all zero and ones, and you're making an exact zero for one copy. Yet somehow the the fact that you have this certificate of ownership and providence locked into it gives it mass value in a way that just the copy doesn't. It's amazing because the copy doesn't matter. JPEGs. It doesn't matter. Picture doesn't matter. It's the ownership, and that is the part you cannot copy. That is the important part. And basically, this is proven by people that the people don't care that everybody can copy it. And it's actually, if you think about it, it's very stupid to, to tell artists to hide your art. Make sure you lock it down. If everybody wants to see it, sue them. Because that is what the uh, what the current copy protection scheme is trying to uh, trying to do with uh, to artists, mm -hmm. and in this way you don't have to. You can show your art, and if anybody wants to support you, they can. And you and you don't need anybody else to to make this happen. So the same thing as you have your small stall in the in the in the country fair, and you sell your your prints. It's the same thing exactly, but now you can do it over the internet. I might ask, so like what you're saying to me sounds like the JPEG doesn't matter. Now when mm -hmm. NFT matters, because it can have like some additional features to it and some additional utility cases. But like if we're looking at an artist who's great at creating his art, but for example, he or she is, they don't know like what additional utilities to create. So does it put them in, in a position where they have to have like certain producer to like come up with some community thing? Uh, maybe, but no. in this case, when it comes to art, it's very simple. Nobody cares about that. All, all people care about it, that the, this, this NFT was created by George and now I have it. Actually, you can think in this case is not actually that this is a very good use case because it's very simple. And with platforms like Galaxies and a lot of uh, different uh, platforms, creating these NFTs is as easy as using a web page, uh, a web browser. As long as you can do that, you don't need anything extra. And look at Jot. Jot heard about uh, this technology from me, but the tables turned very quickly, and now he's the one I am going to to learn about how to engage communities. Jor, whoa, 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 whoa. what was your learning curve on that? <laughs> like, how did you get there? How did you, how did you get to your telling Andros what to do? <laughs> I'm curious. Well. I'm just, I'm, no, no, George very quickly actually just started to provide what his community wanted. And me trying to focus on communities in general and not specifically in specific use cases went much slower. But since Joel was an artist, he, 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 he immediately see what his community wanted and he provided. Like this thing that Joel mentioned, I actually um, uh, uh, noted it down, the mm -hmm. personal connection, everything, is basically what Galaxies does and what Jot did it on his own. But what Galaxies does it, it enables personal collection between the members of the community and the center of the community or the, or the own owner of the art and the, and the artist. This is incredibly important. And when we are talking about value, this is what we are talking about. We are not talking about monetary value. 
it is I value that I can have a personal collection to show it by by owning some of these pieces. Now let, let, let me let me Tony let me bring you in here. We we had an interesting discussion uh, before the show where my traditional way or our traditional way of putting these invitations together is to put headshots of each of the speakers. And then I heard yeah. you wanted to use your CryptoPunk and I was like, okay, that's really, you know, a interesting idea. It doesn't really work for this one, but it, it opened my mind and I started thinking about it. Like, what, what is my own personal bias? Like, what, what what's my problem? And, and I was trying to parse through, you know, maybe it's an age thing or something like I have an affinity to, to looking at people in the face. And, you know, it's interesting that you're actually meeting people in real life, but I'm seeing it, you know, everywhere where people represent themselves with these JPEG images or avatars, or they're they're okay. signing GitHub not with their name but with their hexadecimal string. What, what what does it what does that mean? Is that more or less personal, or is it a different kind of personal? Can you what's the philosophy there? I, I think it's, it's both. I mean, it's just it's just the way of looking at it. So, so a couple of things. One, I'm I'm certainly older than you. I'm much older than you, and. Uh, for me, I'm not um, sure, my friend. I, yeah, yeah. Trust me, I, I know I'm older than you. So, so, okay. but, but here's the thing. So, I, you know, I, you, I sent you the, the, I sent. I think I don't know who it was that was Anastasia. Somebody sent me and said, you know, what, what's the, what, what do you want to use as your picture? And I'm like, oh, I always use my PFP. And mm -hmm. I sent, the, I sent the PFP, and then they're like, oh no, no, we want a picture of you. Or, I, you know, and I was like, I was gonna push back and say, you know, because I could basically say. No, I won't do the interview without my PFP. And now that sort of like puts you in a difficult spot because you're like, oh, well, you know, screw it. You know, either A, you're going to say, no, you know, we're not going to do it. So, you know, or I can just go so on the internet and find your picture and use it without even asking. Which somebody, which somebody has actually done with, with yeah. a prominent member of the community who, who, who goes by Sergito Sergito and they use this like this weird picture. We don't even know where he got it from. But the, the idea is that. The, the for instance, my punk has become my identity. More people know me for my punk than they do me know me personally, right? Like, like if you tell people who who does this punk, you show them a picture of my punk and say who does this belong to. A lot of people who are familiar with punks are going to say, "Oh, that's Tony Herrera," right? Even though there's a few other punks that are that, that look exactly some very similar to it. Um, but I think it's also it's it's a really interesting because you you basically brought it up. It's like okay. Society is still at that point. This is the nascent aspect of blockchain and 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 the T's is that we're still like it's, we're still very early. As much as we progress, we're still very early. Where even like for most mainstream media, they're not going to want to use uh, a, a picture of a of a of a board ape or a, or a punk as somebody's identity, right? And and so when it comes to identity, this this is a totally different subject with when it comes to identity on the blockchain because like mm -hmm. let's let's take it back to, to Zolt and his art actually I, i'm sorry let me know one second do, do you know dave ronan smith personally dave ronan smith yeah personally no okay but you I communicate with him so. and I, dave i know you're watching this the um, actually I'm, I'm gonna take a risk given the zoom bombing that happened last time dave i'm gonna allow Got you it. to talk um just he, he said he got to know you through your crypto punk so i i, I want to get the bandstand involved okay, here okay cool uh dave if, if you're not comfortable with this just say so and we'll, we'll i'll meet you again but we'll, we'll get i'm using this new web uh, webinar control okay uh dave yeah. can you hear me hey oh that works hey oh, cool. how's it going how are you thanks for the introduction gordon hey, hey, how's hey thanks awesome. for coming in Good, good, good. Hey, Tony, finally get to meet your face. Hey, Dave, how are you doing? You over the phone. I've never spoken to you in person, but we've chatted a lot on DM. Yes, cool. On Twitter, yeah. And I was just saying hey, that on I'm, Twitter. I'm... So, 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 Dave, just just for my own, your because your Twitter handle is is isn't Dave Ronan Smith. I it's know, Dave I Ronan. know. I now now it's coming to mind. Yes, yeah. because we've we've spoken on Twitter DMs. So yeah, yeah. for. For the uninitiated, and, and on this, there will be a, a Twitter direct message. Yeah, yeah. We, we, because my DMs I are met, open. I yeah, met Tony to on, on, on Twitter DM, yeah. And I, I know Tony by his by his, uh, by his his punk. So And that's how I got introduced into the punk community and into Andras and all these guys through these punk communities and knowing people by the icons that they have, the, those, those identities they carry. 
it's like your crypto novo you know that that specific punk i know exactly who that person is by that punk right so i just wanted to bring that into the conversation well I, actually let, let's explain Dave, Dave, stay on let's, let's explore that idea because to me it's weird but it's, yeah. i mean but i sorry i i don't i don't mean it's weird like you're weird i mean to me no, no, it's no, an no, unusual no. experience that yeah. is a little bit dis disconcerting and i have to sort okay. of adjust my brain to deal with it even though okay. we are in the, like when i look at people who have avatars as their instagram or twitter i'm like what the you know come on just uh, something about me requires seeing someone's face and i'm a, very much aware of what's going on with ai and that kind of slightly freaks me out but you you dave and you tony seem to have crossed that bridge into the other side where you're almost you know tony it's interesting what you said you're more recognizable by your um crypto punk avatar i mean that, that's that's crazy and you know and it, it, it also means i mean you could be the dread pirate robert someone else could take over that avatar when you decide to retire you know i'm making a princess bride reference for anyone who's not as old as i am okay you you know you, you, you someone could replace you and carry on the legend and who would know <laughs> well and what do you do with that, that? I, I i would argue David, Dave, let me weigh in. I would argue that it's actually really easy for you to determine whether it's me or not. Yeah. And the way that you can do it is that you can basically say, all right, Tony, if it's really you, send a transaction by signing a transaction on the blockchain to prove that it's you because I'm the only one who controls that wallet, right? So yeah. we talked about, we started at the top of the show about messaging. We're, we're getting, we're, we're at the stage now where like text messages, I could send you a text message saying, hey, um, you know, uh, Gordon, I'm, I'm stuck in, I can send you a, a, a simple text message, say I'm stuck in Tokyo and I need you to send me some Ethereum or Bitcoin because I lost my wallet. You, you could actually, you would know that it's me, but on the blockchain, you would actually, I could prove to you that it's me because I could mm -hmm. sign the transaction on the blockchain. That is only, that I'm the only person who's able to sign the transaction would be me from either my principal wallet or any other wallet that I have. And that is something that is very much a technology that's only available through the blockchain that isn't available in another system. So yes, yeah, somebody can spoof your identity in real life and other areas, but it's really difficult to spoof. It's actually impossible to spoof somebody's identity on the blockchain. I was actually making, I was actually, I, I hear what you're saying. I was actually making a slightly different point, which is this may not be a bug. This may be a feature. Like there may be now an a institution called Tony. Now, if, you're, if your face is associated with your physical body and you decide to retire, then there's a disconnect there if someone else takes over. But if you're like the Dread Pirate Robert, or you're the, sort of this abstract digital representation and people are dealing with you through electronic communications, maybe you're not a person, maybe you're an office and people kind of rotate in and out as needed by the community. It, it just, it, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying it, it, it opens a possibility now that did not exist before. And maybe we need to think that through. Satoshi I'm not, I feel like you want to comment. Yeah, Satoshi Nakamoto, it's an institution, it's not a mm. person. And then I guess there can there can also be a thing That's when like, right. you know how people talk about your personal brand and how do you evaluate the value of your personal brand? And now if you're you are represented by this NFTs and if the value if the value of you as a personal brand goes up, then it can be represented by this NFT. I'm like, I have one question. So like Tony and Dave. How did the process look like when you decided to like switch your photo with this NFT avatar? Like how, like what motivated you to now say that, okay, I want my digital identity to be represented by this NFT and not just my face. Dave, you want to go first? Um, yeah, I'll speak for myself because I'm, I'm new to NFTs compared to Tony and compared to Andras, um, obviously, like, I didn't mint any crypto punks or any of those kind of things. So I'm still newer than that. I'm still catching up. But for myself, um, because I have, I have various companies and I have various other jobs that I do, I prefer not to have my personal face attached to my Twitter profile. Um, because that way you can use Google image and you can find a lot more about me than I prefer people to know about me unless I really want that person to know who I am. Mm -hmm. So I personally use PFPs or other graphic representations um, for myself. But a lot of people will know me by my handle or your ENS handle, which is your name server handle, uh, which is also an NFT, essentially, which only you can own. 
Um, and this is great because then you can change your wallet addresses and people still know who you are because your, NF your ENS name is your name. And then it points to where you want to point that to. Um, so my personally, I, I prefer not to represent myself with my physical facial, um, my, my physical face on my web profiles. Uh, on my Facebook, I do, obviously, but, but not on my Twitter handle. And I speak to the broader, broader people with, in the sector. So your think, Twitter handle isn't like so directly connected with your name, because obviously on Facebook, no, my, my real, real my real name is not Dave Ronan. My I use that as a as a pseudonym. Uh, on Facebook, before. you also have this I, I name. Use, I use the name Ronan because I because Dave my my real name is Smith, um, but English Dave Smith is really common. I'm sure you would appreciate that. There's a lot of Dave Smiths on the planet, so getting a .dot com or anything like that is is highly unlikely. So I spent about three months looking for a dot com and a Twitter handle and an Insta handle that all matched. And I happened upon Dave Ronan. And it's quite apt because a Ronan is a masterless samurai who used to be a samurai. And he didn't kill himself in honor of mm. his fallen master. And then he became a Ronan. And a Ronan usually ended up becoming a swordsmith, which is people who work with steel. And my last name is Smith. So I thought it was quite apt to have that um. bridge between the two that I'm a not masterless warrior who doesn't follow those traditions, but I still have the ability to develop and, and build for myself, which is, which is, so I, I use the handle and that's how people know me. And that's how I, I like to be known to this community of people. Key question. Are you, are you a Frank Miller fan? I'm sorry. I don't know who Frank Miller is. I'll Google him that, and I'll let you know. My, my friend, okay. <laughs> I'm dating myself. That, that's a he's, comic he's, artist he's, in the eighties and nineties who did a graphic novel called Ronan that which is freaking awesome. So you should immediately find that. Oh, so David, 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 David Miller, he, he did Batman Peter also. Star Wars fan. Sorry, Tony, what did you say? Tony. I said you're more of an Akira Kurosawa fan. I don't know who that is either. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Akira Kurosawa, Akira Kurosawa did... Uh, oh, Kurosawa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He, Seven he, Samurai. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The famous yeah, Japanese... The famous yeah, uh, Japanese director who did a lot of really good films. I, I do, the I Hidden do Fortress love the, and stuff like that. Yeah, I do love the, the Japanese culture. I love the, you know, the obviously I'm a South African male, so we're very physical. So doing combat, hand-to-hand -hand combat and stuff like that's always intrigued me. But I do, I do, I do enjoy having a nice. Ronin tag. So I've, oh, I've got yeah, the handle. Go on the, Amazon, <laughs> order Frank Miller Ronin. Trust me. Okay, <laughs> Marco. I'll check it out. You, you, you kind of doing, late, but I'm happy to have you on. This is our new webinar. See, I, I, it's it's 7 a.m. here. How is that late? I want your excuses. I'm, I'm working on. I'm, I'm working on Andrash time for this show. I thought it was the same time every week. You know, Crypto Wednesday, something you could count on. No. <laughs> but oh, I'm glad well, you made there it. you go. Uh, is my camera working? Just you know, you made me put a shirt on. So I did. I, yeah, Marco is notorious for like being shirtless. Hold on here. I live in the uh, Cayman Islands. <laughs> Who needs right, I'm, I'm, I'm promoting you to panelists. Don't embarrass me. <laughs> okay. Uh, I won't embarrass you. Uh, you should be able to do it. Right? Oh, wait. Hold on here. Uh, 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 go. There you go. I'm, I'm using the fan. Good morning in the Cayman Islands. So, you know, oh, oh and unmute yourself, by the way. Hey, Cassandra. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're saying something good, but you're on mute. Ah, I'm not muted now. No, you're not. Okay, good. Okay, you joined cool. late, but do you get do you get the theme of the conversation? Uh, the theme seems to be, uh, you know, in the eight minutes I had, <laughs> um, it seems to be, uh, well, obviously it's... Okay, well, Marco will figure out his life. And I'll Sam, I, I'm going to promote you to panelists. We actually have someone very special uh, in the audience here. There she is. Hold on. Huh? Wow, we got a good group here. Ali I died. Sam. <laughs> Hold on, Marco. You, you lost your spot for a second. I just got out of the shower, and I'm not like Marco. I don't need to show everything off. <laughs> oh, rude. <laughs> Okay, guys, let, let's, let's stay on topic. So please give us perspectives on NFTs building 21st century communities. Marco, you can Man, share. That's, 
Or uh, okay, go, I mean, go, go, go. Um, my, well, pick one, Gordon. You, you're the moderator. <laughs> uh, she, she was on mute, so I, that's fine. Marco, go. Okay. Um, using NFTs is, I don't know, I, I find it disturbing. Um, the idea that we're going to mint millions and millions and millions and millions, okay, let's be fair, trillions of unique identifiers for people um, or unique identifiers for things. Mm -hmm. And then let's tack on the derivative unique identifiers for collectives of things uh, or just re-representations of a thing, uh, possibly with more art or... Uh, you know, avatar -y kind of feel to it. You know, the, 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 the discussion between whether I put my real face somewhere or an avatar of myself somewhere. Um, from a security perspective, I totally agree. No one should put their picture anywhere. There's enough video surveillance cameras out there already. The last thing you want them to be able to do is cross match you with everything else. But I don't believe that blockchain based NFTs are the long-term solution to, to some of the things that they tend to be trying to attack. And that starts with uh, things like soul bound concepts uh, or, you know, a token that is uniquely tied to a particular human being. Uh, the capacity for evolution and, and derivation and the fundamental change that, you know, humans do on a regular basis is kind of the antithesis of an NFT. And definitely not supportable on a blockchain when you start to think about how much a person changes in a given day. Um, let me let me jump in and for a second. Kind of so catch the, that to an NFT. I, I know I'm going to let the other panelists speak. But I want to say I, I don't think that the use case that they're talking about is as a strict digital representation of the person's identity and legal rights. I think it's a useful way of like encompassing certain features of an ownership position that they have, such as a membership. And Andras? Actually, Marco Actually. is really right. <laughs> NFTs, oh, okay. NFTs are a horrible way to be used as an identity in terms of identity, not, not, like, a, not like, a, like, a, like a digital representation for somebody like for branding purposes, which is fine. But as a digital identity, NFTs are horrible things. And so bound tokens are also, how do I put this? It's not a great idea. Uh, and, uh, and this is also not a, not a good way to use the technology. And that kind of shows, I'm sorry for being cheeky here, that even Vitalik can have bad ideas <laughs> from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, what NFT, using NFTs as membership cards uh, for me, it is it is a good use case because in this way you don't I, I uh, as let's say I, I provide a, uh, this uh, this community and I provide this membership card I don't need to and I don't want to know who is behind that membership card it can be a man a woman on an AI or six rats in a trench coat I don't mind and I don't care as long as somebody can provide that membership card and prove that they own it they can use the benefits of that card. And I don't have to know anything about them and I love it that way. In this way, this actually provides the much needed privacy for us in communities as well, because we don't, I don't, they don't need to, need to share even a username or an email address or a password. None of that is needed. As long as they can provide uh, ownership of that card, proof of ownership, they are good. And in this way, we can actually start providing services like software as a service or any kind of services to people of whom we don't need to collect information. And I wouldn't think it be so much simpler though if you're going to go down that route. I mean, I'm not saying the use case is wrong. The use case is pretty much, you know, one of the fundamental types of use cases we have in living as humans in our social world. Yeah. What's wrong with just using a BIP37 key? Uh, the big difference is, and I think in not always, but uh, but very often, uh, the difference is that in this way, we can keep these membership cards as a physical, almost like a physical object, tangible, meaning if I'm done with that membership, I can sell it. So it can actually be transferred between people without a third party. So 
let's say let let me give you a different a different uh, use case there are millions in this case let's say i play a game i i build up my character i have i spend hundreds of hours on this and when i'm done with the game i can actually as long as there is demand i can actually sell to somebody that i created and i could actually come uh, like 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 move on with something else and all of these things actually belong to me and nice belongs to somebody else and not to a third party company not to a company who mm -hmm. who has created the game mm -hmm. and i think this kind of ownership can be the very important use case of nfts and yes bip, bip 37 or 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 whichever uh, we we go with can also uh, be used but in many cases for example memberships games in other places it would be very important and useful for people to be able to to freely move these things around if they, and if they don't want it anymore they can sell it they can give it away yeah i mean just to say the use case already exists people buy and sell in-game characters in-game weapons things like that let me finish uh they do sell them already now yes it's a kludgy off-platform way of doing things but damn is it a big marketplace uh tying things to a cryptographic key smooths things out what but you don't what, really need anything more key, than a key tied to the data you know if you have the if you have the key you can use the data and you can push that key to somebody else I think the big difference is that with a system like this, we can actually get a new wave of these games or, or these environments that actually actively encouraging it and, and uh, letting the people own their assets in a way mm -hmm. that it not depends, not uh, connected to that specific environment. And this, I, I want this kind of tangibility, this kind of uh, physical object kind of uh, property that uh, if I do something in that game, if I build my weaponry, if I build my, 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 uh, my character, then it's mine. And just because they switch off the servers, they can't take it away from me. But they yeah. take away its value. I have something to say, which is really cool because I was actually there when the first NFT was minted and it was actually back very, very, very early on when people don't even realize and they don't understand the history of the NFT. So NFTs were actually invented in 2014. Um, they didn't have a name until like 2017, the end of it. Um, my book that I wrote with Eric Poulier is the is very interesting because Eric Poulier and Craig Sellers invented NFT um, that have smart contracts behind them. And the story is really fascinating because I agree with you guys 100%, but also disagree with you too. Um, because the first you the first desire for a non fungible token was Eric Poulier was at his bar at Harvell's in Hollywood. And he was sitting with Craig Sellers and Reeve Collins, and they were they were working on Tether. And um, and Eric said to Craig Poulier, he said, or Eric Poulier said to Craig Sellers, he said, "I've got an idea. What if I took my beer and we stuck it on the blockchain, like Bitcoin, but it could actually change state." You know, like it, it could evolve. And when the beer times out, when it gets warm, it expires mm -hmm. on the blockchain. Like it's no longer good anymore. And Craig Seller said, oh, this is recorded. He said, holy effing S-H-I-T. And so he was like, this absolutely revolutionizes, you know, blockchain protocols. Like we just have Bitcoin. It's just for money and stuff. And some other things like Ethereum was coming up during that time process. But never before did we think that we could change items on the blockchain. And that's what um, non-fungible digital, digital assets were made for the blockchain. Now, I think play to earn gaming, which I jumped into it and built a not network two years ago because I saw financially, I thought that was the way to go, um, especially with COVID and all the shutdowns mm -hmm. and the technological advances. I think that play to earn gaming is one of the best use cases that we have right now for NFT mm -hmm. technology. But I do have to disagree somewhat in the sense that we can't put our identities on the blockchain. 
Now, you guys all know that Gordon is an attorney, and there's certain things that need to be identified and have open access on the blockchain. One, that's your driver's license. Two, that's your marriage certificate. Three, that might be a purchase of a car and also the provenance that you built in the car, like the receipts, the oil changes, and so on and so forth. What people don't understand is NFTs are not just digital currencies on a blockchain um, or, you know, somewhat in a loosely definition of it. They're actually, there's 32 use cases right now. I just wrote a fucking encyclopedia on the goddamn things. They're fucking robust as hell. And I'm here to tell you like coupons, you guys have NFTs, even if you didn't want to purchase them because a non-fungible asset is nothing simply but airline points within an application. And then what the blockchain does is that makes it tradable and accessible to any other protocol mm -hmm. that interacts with blockchain technology. So we have to go back and we have to think, you know, what is, we have to actually define what a non-digital asset is on the blockchain and what the different use cases are going to be. Because I'm here to, I, Andres, I'm 100% with you. I'm actually developing, raising $200 million for a, a privacy social media app that uses NFTs as your identity. So you can be anonymous or not, like you have that choice. And I think as we step into Web3, that's what we need to remember is Web3 and its extension of reality. And there's things that are going to be very private about our lives that nobody should have access to they don't have a right we have a human right to privacy um but also there's things we can't grow communities if we, if the world is completely embounded by privacy there's no growth there's no unity there's no access you know and there there's no healing or solving any of the world issues because we keep ourselves very contained and very private so I think NFTs are a great technology with a lot of great use cases. And right now, as we are early on, I agree with you, Andres, it's not a good use case to like sit there and put our entire identities on the blockchain. But in the future, there's going to be a lot of aspects of our identities that are going to be incorporated into non-fungible assets in Web3. And by the way, we know the, our, the speaker is a crypto OG. She's the real deal. I've known her for years. So... That's yeah, I think I've cried to you for about eight years about people abusing me and when, 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 and then who I was going to kill on the blockchain, blah, 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 blah. blah. Let, let, let's not put that on a nice recorded show, but let, let's, oh, just, yeah, let's, let's just say, <laughs> okay, but you know, we, we all have our rough spots. I had a very rough spot two years ago, as you know, or two and a half years ago, but you know, it all, it all works out and happy to support you because you've, you've added a lot to the community. You've helped a lot of people and you're a pioneer and. I chatted you directly, which is we need we need to get you on the show also. So just just give me some kudos. This is not random bandstand to hear. This is inner circle, but I'd love to get some responses. Andrash, I think we have uh, philosophical the uh, philosophical uh, uh, debate of bear, uh, happening here on the nature of identity and whether or not privacy is a block to uh, community building. I don't believe it is. Um, fair, fair, fair be, be, let's be private go. and a member of a community very effectively. Is, is there okay? So, is there any? I think you may have just covered this, but is is there any anything inherently privacy violation violating about NFT technology, or is it just like anything else? It can be used that way, but it's not inherent. It's not, a, yeah, no, but it's, it's a data, but let's break it down to what it is at its core. Mm -hmm. It is a record in a database that has a unique identifier. Okay, and then you That's can, all it is. and therefore non-fungible. Well, it is it is fungible. It's just not uh, exchangeable for similar because there are no similar, right? Okay, so it's like if, if you've got a particular diamond, diamonds are fungible, let's be fair, right? But there are diamonds that are unique. Right. It is a, you know, it's a 17 carat uh, emerald cut diamond. Right. And there's only one of them on the planet. You can think of an NFT as that unique version of a diamond, but that doesn't mean that diamonds aren't fungible. It's a fungible thing. It's just not fungible within its, uh, it's not a generic diamond. It's not a one carat industrial diamond, which you can, you know, they're easy to get. All right. Look, pause for a second. Let, let, let me, so, Tony, 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 Tony. Yeah. I, I actually want to weigh in on Marco, which, which he brought something up with diamonds. And let's think about diamonds and where energies could potentially be beneficial for diamonds. So let's let's go through that process and let's let's have some back and forth with uh, Marco on this. So Marco, what 
What makes a diamond rare and who decides the rarity of that diamond? The beers. The beers. Who is the beers? The beers has the monopoly on production of diamonds and okay. distribution. So, all right. So, the beers, where does the beers lay in terms of who are they in the supply chain of diamonds? They're the source. Okay. I don't think they're the, they're the source. Do they own the mines? They're, 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 they, no, they, they, own, they own control of the mines. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. So, let's look at an unfungible token. What if I said to you, why don't we have, let's say Gordon is the processor. Let's say, let's say Gordon is the guy who discovers the diamond, the actual stone, and takes it to, they call them manufacturers. I, I like to call them processors. What if that processor is Andrash, and Andrash basically cuts the stone, and basically Andrash then gets it certified. Right now, right now you have a couple of certified embodies. The most, the most prevalent one is GIA, the Gemological mm -hmm. Institute of America. And the reason why I mentioned this is because are you, you're probably aware that diamonds are graded and the rarity of the diamond can then also be changed at some point in time. And the rarities of the diamond can also affect severely the price of that diamond. So mm -hmm. blockchain could actually help NFC. So imagine that Gordon, once again, picks up a diamond, takes it to Andrash, who's the processor. And now Andrash basically says, I'm going to get to Gemalaka Jew Institute to certify the diamond rarity. So then now that is all put onto the blockchain through an NFT. So you have an NFT that represents that diamond because the NFT can mm -hmm. represent a physical good. In this case, the rarity of that diamond is now recorded on the blockchain. It, re it records that it, the source was Gordon, the processor manufacturer was Andrash. GIA says, this is the rarity diamond and we're gonna, just for the sake of this argument, Say that it's the rarest diamond in the world, right? It's, it's now become the rarest diamond. In the world. So you have an NFT that represents this diamond, and all that is recorded on the blockchain. And now, somewhere down the line, there's a retailer, and so now Zolt is the retailer, and he's trying to sell that diamond, and he says, "This is the rarest diamond in the world." And the question would be, "Well, why? Who 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 said so, right?" And in this case, the provenance is okay. Well, there is a record on the blockchain that the provenance goes back to Gordon. The processor was Adrash, all that's recorded on the blockchain. The rarity is recorded by the Gemini Constitution Institute of America. That is basically the rarest diamond. And now basically Zolt is, if you will, backed up by the fact that all that data is on the blockchain. So that's a perfect example of why NFT would be valuable if we were able to get diamonds on the blockchain. Now we can't get diamonds on the blockchain because all the powers that are currently supplying the blockchain, like for instance, I would argue anybody who's married on discussing right now, if you ever bought a diamond, you have no way of price discovery on a diamond because you don't know whether the diamond you're getting is actually of the value that the retailer is telling you, or even the diamond dealer is telling you because you have no way of confirming that. You are only basically taking whatever somebody is giving you as a source of pricing for that diamond. Uh, and so sorry, that, I, I got to jump in because I just went through this. I don't think that's quite true. I mean, the you can you can assuming the gemological report is accurate, you, you have Lunal, you have other websites. There's a lot of them, and I'm in Dubai, yeah. and and it's back end yes. vendor websites. You can very closely approximate, but it's like not very you, you can pretty though. nicely approximate like, what you have. But it's like going to a physician. You're getting um, an observation on this diamond, <laughs> and you know, and Jim Blow is going to say it's worth twenty five billion, and you know, mm. Oster is going to say it's worth a hundred billion. You know, it's an opinion, and yeah, and I agree with you, Tony, one hundred percent. And this is another reason that diamonds are perfect for NFTs because diamonds fall into a category of semi fungibility, and they're they're fungible and they're also non fungible at the same time. And semi-fungibility is a, a perfect use case for NFTs because um, that's when you need the marketplace. And a lot of institutions and early million and billionaires saw um, NFT te technology being very useful in gold and diamonds um, because you, diamonds, especially if the transfer and watches, I had a watch guy offer me a lot of money to build him a marketplace um, for um, luxury watches built on the blockchain. And that's really cool because he was bringing me watches from like Michael Jordan and so on and so forth, which built the provenance and how much was value behind that. And they wanted all that backed on the blockchain. 
So I think, yeah, Tony, I a hundred percent agree with you. And then when you guys asked you, like, how does that build community? Well, you know, it does, it builds community because when you've got a diamond dealer and um, somebody who tells you how much it's valued at and everybody starts going there and he's got a community, he's built his resume, you know, you've got a community discussing his work, his brand, you know, if it's legit or not, you've got a community using NFT technology and the data behind it you know, to grow trust. And I think that's where it's very useful and what we need to use it for. You think you guys, we're, we're coming up, that's interesting. We're coming up on the hour and a half. I, I want to I want to end with a bank, especially because Andrash and I have to get ready for his fantastically festive dinner and hash out who's saying what <laughs> and all that other fun stuff. But let, let's, it's a great conversation. Just, just kind of bottom line it for me your, your vision for the future how where nfts are taking us when it comes to communities what communities are just if you want to leave us with a message choose and i'll just kind of go through the order of the panelists andrash please it's basically the the blockchain technology when it was invented uh, was created to to enable value uh, transfer value over the internet without a trusted third party this is its main and in my opinion only value proposition. Different types of uh, the, uh, the technology, fungible or not fungible, can give, can enable transport different types of values between uh, two entities without a third party. As long as a use case fits into this, uh, into this uh, or can benefit from this value proposition, it's a good use case. And in many ways, when it comes to communities, it is possible for the center of the community to give value to the members and let the members provide value back. And in this case, this is a good use case for communities. Everything else, we, we, need, to, uh, we need to kind of build up on this. But the most important thing is it enables value over the internet without a trusted third party. And everything else needs to build up on this one. If it cannot use this use case, it cannot use this value proposition. It's not a good use case uh, for blockchain. At least this is my opinion. Joel, please. Hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. You're Hungarian yes. special. <laughs> <laughs> I picked up from Andras. Yeah. So I, I think um, on top of the use case of the, the ownership and what uh, Andras just mentioned before, the the people start to shine through the shield of the avatar slowly and through the ownership and the sense of community and the same goals this uh, technology can bring people together uh, stronger than ever before very soon interesting okay tony i think uh zoldan and Andras did a really good job of summing it up to me um I, I really think fundamentally blockchain is going to change a lot of things that we do in society. And I think we'll, we'll sort of see it soon with, uh, with NFTs because I mentioned earlier that NFTs could be anything. And I think we're, we're really not, a lot of people aren't thinking about it is like NFT can basically be just a, a customer product. I mean, think about anything that you consume mm. and um, you know, we talked about diamonds, but really, uh, I think that at least main, mentioned uh, cars and other things. I mean, we're we're about to usher in a period of of any item that could be in an in an NFT. I, I actually had a conversation with somebody the other day where we were talking about um about how you can be the most responsible consumer now through NFTs because if you decided that you didn't want to consume an item that contained any, a particular ingredient, or let's say that you wanted to properly dispose of a, an item that has some sort of chemical or 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 something that needs to be recycled, you can actually achieve that now through NFTs where you can say, I am no longer gonna consume a product. So I'm gonna search products where the manufacturer is willing to take custody of the um, of this NFT that was started off as an NFT that is a, a product that is a redemption token for a product that then I send it back. I essentially call upon the smart contract and say, Gordon, you made this widget I no longer have any use for this widget and it's reached its life cycle. I don't want to send this widget back to you. 
because I mm -hmm. want you to be the, the custodian of the disposal. And that's what an NFT can do. And the, and the, and the fact that we're going to see those kind of items in the near future is for me is, is staggering because um you know we're we're, cons we're human beings we, we consume all sorts of products services and all those products and services can easily be an nft interesting okay, that's a good point to end on end on all right everyone thank you so much for joining crypto wednesday's number uh 30 we're, we're back in gear for 2023 i want to thank our guests marco elise thank you so much really appreciate it our panelists were fantastic wonderful co-host Thank you, Anastasia. You, you rock as always. Really appreciate it. Um, and I am going to stop recording and see you next week.